Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we're going to be in conversation about genocide, what it is, and its history. My guest for this is Barry Trachtenberg. Barry Trachtenberg holds the Rubin Presidential Chair in Jewish History at Wake Forest University in North Carolina. He is a scholar of modern Jewish history, the Nazi Holocaust, and modern Yiddish culture. He's the author of several books, including The United States and the Nazi Holocaust, and Holocaust and the Exile of Yiddish. Barry Trachtenberg is also a member of the Jewish Voice for Peace Academic Advisory Board, and last week he submitted expert testimony on the lawsuit filed by the Center for Constitutional Rights seeking an emergency order to stop military and diplomatic support for Israel's assault on Gaza. Barry Trachtenberg, it is my good pleasure to welcome you to this program. Thank you, Mitch. It's really a pleasure to be here. The word genocide, it, it's a modern word uh, coined by Raphael Lemkin during World War II. It's a compound word made up from both a, a Greek genos, which means a people or a race, and then the side part comes from Latin, which means to kill. Obviously, looking back in history, before World War II, we all acknowledge that genocides have occurred. But, but before that, w w before World War II, was there no word for it or concept that was recognized internationally? Yeah, there, there was neither a word nor a, a concept of, of genocide prior to World War II. Of course, in the decades prior to that were many genocides now that were later identified as such. But we just didn't have the name and we didn't have the understanding of the concept. And it really took the experience of World War II to, to bring this idea to international understanding. And so it wasn't a, even a crime before World War II. It was not a crime. I mean, there, there there weren't really international bodies. I mean, there was the League of Nations, which, you know, was sort of a more abundant institution at times, which was trying to um, establish an international law. But of course, the United States very famously was not a part of that. Um, so it really took, you know, the, the, the war itself, the creation of the United Nations, finally, for, for this to come about. Raphael Lemkin, as I, as I indicated earlier, uh, coined the term in 1944. Who, who was Raphael Lemkin? So Raphael Lemkin was a legal scholar who in the 1930s began to study accounts of mass murder. He looked, for example, at the experience of Armenians during World War I, uh, where well over a million um, are, are murdered by nationalist Turks uh, at the moment when the Ottoman Empire is breaking down. That led him to look at this as a larger phenomenon. He identified massacres of Syri uh, Assyrians as well in the 1930s. And then during the, of the, world, the Second World War, he lost 49 members of his own family to the Nazis. Um, he was a, a Jewish jurist, um, who, who's from the Ukrainian city of what's today Lviv, which was then Lvov, Poland, when it was under Nazi occupation, it was Lemberg. So it's a, it's a city whose name has changed many, many times. He managed to escape and began to write very, very passionately about the need to have uh, not only an, a name for this type of crime, but uh, international legal apparatus that would allow for the prosecution of this crime. And this idea was in tension with another idea that was being formulated at the same time and out of similar experiences by a figure named Hirsch. Um, uh, oh my gosh, uh, his last name's uh, escaping me at the moment. Uh, it'll come back. Um, who was arguing similarly that there needed to be a crime for you know human rights violations um, and the the tension between the two ideas was should um, states be held accountable right um, and and sh or I'm sorry let me, let me rephrase that should um, the crime be against groups or should it be against individuals and where should that tension should be on individual rights or the rights of groups um, and ultimately, we have both that came about in 1948, where we have the Genocide Convention and we have the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Um, but those two ideas were in tension for, for some time among legal scholars trying to figure out really the, the best way to set up an international order to prosecute this seemingly new level of crimes that were being committed. Yeah, it's really interesting to think about Raphael Lemkin uh, already having studied what later we would 
coin as genocides. You mentioned the Armenian genocide, yeah. and then firsthand witnessed the rise of fascism uh, and, and the rise of the Nazis. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it, it seemed at the time to most observers, and Lemkin was an exception, that the, what the Nazis were doing was utterly new in the world. Um, people had not uh, experienced, people in Europe, we should say, had not experienced that level of violence being turned on other Europeans. Um, and it, there, was, there were very few people who were, were sort of understanding that this was actually part of a much larger phenomenon that wasn't just restricted to the, the Nazis and what later becomes known as the Holocaust, but was uh, a, a crime that had yet to be identified, but was actually quite widespread. As we now know, because of uh, scholars of, of, of uh, European imperialism and post-colonialism, we know that genocide is sort of fundamental to uh, the, the project of colonialism, right? And we can go back, you know, centuries um, to identify that what did seem to be new at the time was that this genocidal impulse that had sort of always been reserved for colonial spaces was now being turned inward onto other European peoples. And that in part was uh, sort of responsible for the shock that so many people experienced. They thought that kind of barbarism, right, only happened outside of Europe and, um, you know, other Western spaces, not sort of acknowledging that it was often Europeans and Americans who brought that sort of brutality to those spaces. Yeah, Hitler was very much influenced by what happened by, by U.S. history. Uh, absolutely, very much so. You know, very famously, he, he spent his, his, uh, a lot of his leisure time reading Westerns. And um, when formulating early Nazi policy after he comes into power in 1933, there were uh, legal scholars who came to the United States to study U.S. legal codes at, um, in order to try to identify mechanisms to create a racial state in Germany. So the U.S. served as a model in, unfortunately, in a number of very unpleasant ways. There's a great book by the scholar James Whitman actually called this Hitler's American model, which is really quite important and influential, which I teach regularly with my students. Yeah, we had him on a few years ago oh, and did great. a whole, whole hour okay. with him. It was important. Um, yeah. We may, now, now you bring it up, I may even replay it sometime soon. Um, but Raphael Limpkin, again, uh, he, he's recognizing what's happening early on. Is he trying to raise the alarm and he's just not getting... The audience, people well, just aren't. He's, he's raised the alarm, and he writes this very, very important work in, in 1943, where um, sort of in the middle of the war, where he's really um, uh, trying to press the case that the Nazis are doing something, at least in, in Europe, w which, you know, hadn't been done before, where, you know, an entire population is being sort of segregated out uh, of society that he goes through in, in this work, and he lists, you know, a whole series of laws and regulations that are being put forward, and um, really seeks to, uh, to demonstrate these laws are not just about segregating Jews out of society, but ultimately leading towards this goal of their elimination from society. Um, after the war, he is uh, an important figure in pressing the legal case against Nazis. He's in, he works with uh, Justice Jackson and others and the, the, the Nuremberg trials that, you know, that take place in the immediate aftermath of the war. He's very, very essential in the the incredibly contentious debates that happen in 1947, 1948, around the ratification of the, the, the UN Convention on Genocide, which is passed, you know, in uh, December of, of 48. Um, and he's disappointed, though. He's really quite disappointed with how the convention is ultimately worded in the end, because as a part of the, the debates and conversations, um, some of the parties to the convention, in particular the Soviet Union, very much did not want class or politics to be considered protected categories. Uh, and so those were removed uh, from the convention, but ultimately it was passed and it was seen sort of as a, you know, a great world triumph. But he spent uh, much of the, the rest of his life, and I think he passed away in the, the 1950s, um, trying unsuccessfully to get the United States to actually ratify 
the convention itself. And it wasn't until 1988 that the United States actually ratified the, the treaty um, and did so with its own very complicated uh, stipulations that I'm sure we'll, we'll get to later on in this conversation. That blew my mind when I, when I read that, that the United States didn't ratify the 1948 Convention on Genocide until 1988. It was Ronald Reagan. What was, what was the United States one of those countries that were in opposition to this con convention? No, actually, the United States was essential in getting the UN to ratify it. But by the time that had happened, politics in the United States began to shift um, considerably. And um, the Cold War was beginning to heat up. There was the concern, you know, of communists infiltrating the United States. You know this history, obviously, very well. Um, and then it sort of took a back burner for a period of time because there was a lot of fear among uh, uh, members of the legislature that this could be used, for example, against the United States in, you know, initially in the, the civil rights movement, which, you know, as we know, you know, in the post-war period in the, the 50s, grew very, very brutal and violent. So there's concerns that was going to get used against the United States. By the later 1960s, there's concerns going to get used against the United States for its, you know, mass murders that that uh, that it's committing in in Vietnam. Um, and then, you know, with the bombings in Cambodia and Laos, there's concerns. And so it takes a very, very long time. Um, and, and it's not, you know, until, as, as you said, until the near the end of the Reagan administration that it finally goes through. But it goes through in this way. And, you know, I, we can talk about this now and then maybe return to it when we want to talk about the, the present legal case. Um, the United States exempted itself from being sued by other states when passing that um when ratifying so south, that treaty so so the united so, states would not recognize if south africa brought a genocide case exactly so the way it. that south africa took israel to court in front of the international court of justice that could not happen to the united states um which you know is one of many many examples of the united states sort of exempting itself from the international law that it has historically sought to enforce on other groups and we can think of uh chemical bans uh you know chemical weapons bans for example or the use uh, of, of 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 different uh weapons like cluster bombs and the united states is you know traditionally exempted itself from these but yet seeks to hold other countries to them at different times um, and with this particular situation, with the genocide that's unfolding in Gaza at the moment, we're in this very, very tricky piece. And I, if I'm jumping ahead, you can no, see, no, we're we're we're, we're casual it. here, Barry. Okay. <laughs> with the I'm gonna go where you go. Okay, <laughs> with the the current case of Defense for Children International Palestine versus the Biden administration, um, the 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 legal argument uh, at the center of that case right now is. Does the court have the ability to issue an injunction against the, the executive branch to uh, in force them to stop supplying the weapons uh, it, in, uh, uh, that are being used in, in this genocide that's underway? The U.S. government right now, the executive branch, is saying, no, the courts can't intervene. The consequences of that are, are, are really profound because if states can't take the United States to court, and citizens can't take the United States to court, then what was the purpose of the ratification of the, the genocide uh, convention at all, right? I mean, that means that the, uni the United States is actually allowing itself to engage in genocidal activities without any legal mechanism to stop it. And in large part, that's what's at stake in this current trial. Wow, that's really important. Um, yeah. because you never know who's going to be in power. I mean, right now you have Joe Biden and we're talking about genocide. So, I mean, you, you, yeah. you never know what the future holds. Uh, do yeah. your reading of the language with the stipulations that came with the ratification of the UN Convention on Genocide by the United States in 1988, uh, you said it said specifically, or does it say specifically uh, other states and just doesn't mention, um, it doesn't mention U.S. citizens. Um, but it, it exempts itself from being sued by other states explicitly. Yeah. So is, is that the exact question that this federal judge in Oakland? That is, is the question right now that's at the center of this trial. Um, and 
the, the judge under, seems to understand it really clearly and understands at the same time sort of the, the, the weight of what's at stake. Um, it did not seem clear that he felt confident there was a legal mechanism um, that the, the, the separation of powers um, clauses in the Constitution. He, he was, seemed really quite concerned that that was going to forbid him. Um, but part of the argument that I made in my testimony was that Biden has already gone around Congress several times um, by not asking for authorization to send these weapons. And so if he's ignoring Congress, there's no other check on his power if the courts don't intervene. Yeah. I, I'm really interested, again, in the stipulations of the United States trying to get out, uh, has, you know, divorced itself basically from being, I mean, it could still be prosecuted. The United States just wouldn't recognize it, right? If, if, Sure. Yeah. I mean, they just wouldn't show up, uh, presumably to the, the, the hearing the way Israel did, because Israel didn't exempt itself. It likely wouldn't mount a defense, um, presumably. I mean, hypothetically, we don't know how it would actually respond. Um, but, you know, they just simply wouldn't recognize it. This is Letters and Politics, and we are in conversation with Barry Trachtenberg, who holds the Rubin Presidential Chair in Jewish History at Wake Forest University in North Carolina. He is a scholar of modern Jewish history, the Nazi Holocaust, and modern Yiddish culture. I I'm interested in these stipulations. I'm also interested in what you said earlier about what you called a very contentious debate in 1947 over the Convention of Genocide, that the Soviet Union wanted race, I mean, I'm sorry, wanted politics and, and class, and class uh, ex excluded exempted. from yeah. it. I, I guess, uh, t tell me more about that. Yeah, so the, the, the treaty as it stands now says, and I'm just gonna, I'll just quote to you if I, I can, just the very beginning of it. In the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. And then it talks about what constitutes, you know, what are those acts that would constitute genocide. So the, the, the two key pieces here um, for, you know, the, 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 the case in, in, in part to your question, one is this question of intent, which we should sort of talk about a bit, but to get more to your, your question, you know, the, the categories that are present are national, ethnic, racial, or religious groups. Like those were the, the four groups that all of the parties could agree upon, which is a fairly limited definition, right? So it doesn't, for example, talk about cultural genocide. It doesn't talk about what we now think about as ecological genocide, right? Um, but at the time, the, the other two categories that were sort of very much in play were political groups and class. You know, are there groups that are being targeted for that? Soviet history, you know, um, in 1948, you know, in, in the decades prior to that, was filled with mass murders of, of people who were members of political groups um, or of, of identified classes by the, the, the regime, and they were targeted for, for mass murder. So, for example, in uh, what's today the uh, you know the state of Ukraine, there was a, 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 an intentional starvation campaign a, against the people in, in Ukraine um, in the 1930s that led to millions of deaths. The number is unknown because the documentation doesn't exist, but I've seen estimates anywhere from, from two million to, to seven or eight million people were were killed. They were targeted, excuse me, in part. Because they were identified as being uh, kulaks, meaning sort of uh, well-off peasants. But that definition was so loose, sometimes it could be used against people for simply having one cow or, you know, not turning over their full allotment of wheat. And so there was this forced starvation campaign on them. Scholars debate whether this constitutes fully a genocide. But the Soviet Union certainly did not want this to be a crime to which they would somehow be held accountable. Yeah, that, uh, that uh, hence that's why we don't call a genocide today when there are mass murders that are yeah we we, we have the term like you know ethnic cleansing we we talk about mass murder but genocide is intentionally the uh, the highest bar the sort of like the it's you know it's considered sort of the world's worst crime and so therefore it has this very high bar that where you need to be able to demonstrate intent 
So, for example, you know, some of the, the, the discussions um, that people have had around this, you know, was the bombing of Hiroshima, for example, in Nagasaki a genocide? Was the bombing of Dresden a genocide? According to the definition and to most scholars of genocide, these were, you know, horrific acts of, of mass murder with clearly, you know, um, you know, I, I guess you could say, you know, complicated uh, um, uh, mil military intentions for them. But the goal wasn't uh, at the outset to commit mass murder, right? The goal was to force the Axis powers to, to, to stop pressing the war. What's different about this case um, with what's happening in Israel is that the intention is has been stated repeatedly by the the leaders of Israel, both you know within the government and within the military, that the goal you know over and over again is to you know remove the the presence fully of Gazans to kill all Gazans and to hold them collectively responsible for what happened on October seventh. There have been some comments, obviously. Uh, Israel says that these were ill-advised comments that didn't necessarily uh, mirror the policy and what they're trying to do. What they say they're trying to do is eliminate Hamas. It, it's clear that's not the case. Um, and I think it's important that we take Israeli officials at their word because we're in this very unique position where with Every genocide that has happened previously, maybe with the exception of the Rohingya genocide, um, we, we don't understand what's happening usually until afterwards. You know, leaders uh, of, of countries, uh, they hide their intentions, they use euphemisms, they use coded language, right? So the Nazis spoke about the final solution to the Jewish question. You know, they didn't talk about mass killing. They didn't use that, that language. In their documents, they use code words and so on. What we see here, though, is that, you know, from almost immediately after the, the, the attacks on October 7th, the language of Israeli leaders, whether it's the prime minister, the president, the minister of defense, many other cabinet officials, has been repeatedly to talk about the, the need to collectively hold all residents of Gaza responsible for the crimes. And so you see both their language and then their actions are very much in alignment. And so this is something that's, that's really quite unique in history uh, because very often genocides are hard to prove in a legal sense because it's very difficult to meet that standard of intent. But here, here we see the, the, the intentions very, very clearly. And you see it in statements by, you know, President Herzog, for example, who said that every man, woman and child is responsible for this. We see this in statements, you know, most frighteningly by Prime Minister Netanyahu, who repeatedly invokes the, 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 the biblical image of the Amaleks, who were the ancient enemies to the Israelite people and who God commanded to destroy men, women, children, even to kill their cattle. You know, and according to the, you know, to scripture, King Saul was punished for not having gone far enough, for having spared the lives of some Amaleks. And so he's punished by the by by the divine for that. And so when Prime Minister Netanyahu repeatedly invokes the Amaleks as the enemy in this war, everyone knows that. You know, people know that their Bible, you know, they, whether they're religious or secular, you know, they're familiar with the reference. It's, you know, the arch enemy. Um, and when you're, you're fighting the Amaleks, the, the, the goal is to show no mercy. The goal is to wipe them from the presence of the earth and so that their memory no longer exists. And what we're finding is Israeli actions are corresponding with those intentions. So, for example, when they use these United States supplied, you know, 2,000 pound bombs, uh, you know, the, the mother of all bombs, as they call it, which have, you know, a, a, a massive kill radius, it tells us they're not just, you know, targeting with kind of this laser focus on Hamas leaders, that they're going after population centers when they do this. When they um, render 20 of the 36 hospitals in Gaza non-functioning and leave the other 16 at only, you know, minimal functioning, it tells us that they're destroying the conditions that are present 
to uh, support life, when they pump you know, uh, millions of gallons of salt water um, into the aquifer with the goal of flooding the tunnels, they're literally salting the earth and they're rendering the land inhospitable to agricultural development, right? So they're ensuring that there cannot be a future for the Palestinian people. So, you know, so by, by engaging in this mass killing, by uh, stopping the possibility of uh, food and medicine, you know, essential items to get in, they are destroying the, the possibility of continuing life, which is a clear case of genocide. The public statements by Nazis in, in the 1940s and, and late 1930s, early late 1930s, early 40s, did they not publicly state that they wanted to destroy, to kill, to eliminate Jews? They were mixed, to be honest. You know, there's a famous speech by Hitler that he makes on January 30th, 1939. So this is nine months before the start of World War II. And almost um, two and a half years, really, before what we think of as formally the Holocaust, the mass murder of Jews beginning, he does uh, make a threat that, um, sh I won't be able to quote it exactly, but at this famous speech that he makes, um, he says that, you know, should the, 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 in the international Jewry pull Europe into uh, yet another world war, the result will not be the Bolshevization of the earth, but the annihilation of the Jewish people. So every now and then he makes these, these, these statements, um, but that's long before there's even a war, you know. Uh, once the war began, you know, he certainly talked about the Jewish enemy and eliminating them, but didn't, you know, say explicitly that, you know, all of the Jewish people are going to be exterminated. Um, you have other Nazi officials who do say that at times, um, but again, you know, there's no convention on genocide at this point, right? And so people aren't yet able to kind of piece together what they're hearing with what they're very, very slowly learning about, you know? Um, and so what we find in the, in, in the case of the Holocaust, that it, 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 it takes years, really, for that realization that what seem to be kind of these rhetorical gestures against Jews has now sort of morphed into policy, where there is a clear-cut campaign to destroy European Jews. Right? That process took years. The first signs came in the summer of 1942, uh, where a telegram um, came uh, to the to the, the White House and, to, and Jewish leaders uh, from someone who had spoken to someone who had firsthand knowledge of this it took another year really you know summer of 43 before much of that was confirmed by other eyewitness reports and it took yet another year summer of 44 before the united states really has troops in europe that can do anything about it and here we're in a very very different situation where we have the statements of intention that happen you know right away and then almost immediately that's followed by actions that follow that line and unlike, of course, at World War II, where the United States is opposed to the Nazis, and they go there, and many you know, soldiers sign up to fight because they want to fight against fascism and the Nazis, um, here's the, the genocide that's underway is actually being funded by the United States, supplied militarily, and given sort of political and legal um, cover. In the international arena, we're, 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 the the world has always responded to genocides basically after they've happened. Yeah, I mean, you know, what we have, you know, so I'm just thinking back, to, you know, to to the the 1990s. You know, we would learn about, say, the Rwandan genocide that was underway, or the genocide that was happening in the breakup of Yugoslavia against Bosnian Muslims. Like, it takes an enormous. Um, amount of time and effort to intervene. You know, it took several years, for example, for NATO to, to bomb um, Serbian forces, right, who were, were going after Bosnian Muslims. The Rwandan genocide happened so fast in a period of 100 days, you know, there was, there was no inter, inter intervention. Um, but again, the, the difference in um, these other cases, that the, the debates that are happening in the United States is should the U.S. intervene to stop it, 
here the debate that that we're having that we had in in court last week is can we get the united states to, to stop being complicit in it it's very a very different. different set of questions right you know that we have this whole culture that has developed in the united states over the past 50 years or more really my entire lifetime about memorializing the holocaust and much of that is driven by the sense that the united states did not fulfill its moral responsibility to come to the aid of European Jewry. You know, we have um, Holocaust education mandates, and you know, in more than 30 states in the District of Columbia. We, we have Holocaust museums and memorials all over the, the, the country. We have, of course, the a, a, a phenomenal museum on the National Mall of the, of the United States. Um, and the question that I sort of raised to the judge, like, what's the point of all that? Of all that uh, memorializing and kind of in the aim of atoning, if the United States won't inter, you know, won't interfere to stop this genocide, but instead um, is aiding and abetting it. Do, do the number of deaths matter? Um, obviously, when we say genocide or if we say holocaust we think of the mm -hmm. jewish holocaust of the 1940s we think of six million people dying i mean that that's a huge huge yeah. number but you talked about you know if, if you if you look at bosnia we're, we're talking what in the tens of thousands yeah at yeah that point so numbers you know there doesn't have there's not a threshold that needs to be reached in order for something to, to be declared a genocide it's very much about the intent and the actions and like who's being targeted and for what reason if people are being targeted because they are members of a national ethnic racial or religious group um, whether the entire group or a significant portion of that group is being targeted it raises the question of you know does this constitute a genocide or not if a country has signed on to the 1948 UN Convention on, on Genocide, it, it stipulates that you also have the responsibility, if the genocide is occurring, to stop it. Yes. Yeah. And so what, yes, I mean, that's absolutely the case. And so what um, we were hoping for out of the International Court of Justice was stronger language from that ruling that was released on, on, on Friday. Um, but they did say very, very clearly that th this, uh, that genocide is plausible in this instance. And just even the fact that genocide could be plausible to the ICJ should be enough to convince other states to act to, to stop this, this from happening in the way that South Africa, Bolivia, and you know, many other countries have done in terms of signing on um, to this. But ultimately, you know, there's no mechanism of enforcement that the ICJ has. You know, they, 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 they are not able to issue sanctions. They're, you know, they're, they're, ultimately it comes down to other states being willing to assume that political and moral responsibility to put whatever pressure they can on whoever's committing genocide, you know, to stop it. It also gets caught up in real world politics. And that's another way of saying it's all politics. Yes. Yeah. You're right. And, and it gets complicated, right? We have allegations of a genocide happening against the, the Muslim population in China, the, the Uyghurs. Mm -hmm. but, but there's also a debate like, no, this is just being pushed in order to make the world intervene against China for, you know, geopolitical reasons. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, unless you're in China, and even if you're in China, for most folks, it's probably really hard to know. I think it's very, very often hard to know. And, and this is what makes this, this current case of what's happening to Palestinians and Gaza so exceptional, that everyone is talking on and off the record everyone has a cell phone and so this is one of the first instances of genocide where it's not the perpetrators who are providing the the evidence for us but it's the victims themselves who are providing evidence of their own destruction you know um at the hearing that we had on friday i don't know if you've had a chance if you had a chance to watch it live or see the recording that's available and maybe the link can be made available i, I watched your testimony in preparing oh, for our chat and uh i i heard I, I knew the government uh 
lawyers very much objected to your presence they, there. They, they did. Um, my, I, you know, I, I, you know, I certainly hope my testimony w w was useful, but what was really critical of, about that hearing was that witness after witness spoke about their experiences as Gazans under this uh, genocidal regime. And so we had, for example, two people zooming into the hearing, one a physician from a hospital in Gaza. Um, you know, he was just on the floor of the hospital in a hallway um, talking about his experience. And, and he talked about the destruction of everything he, he knew, his, you know, his family, his home, his school, his neighborhood, his fellow physicians, his teachers, his mentors. And he finally concludes, says, I have nothing left but my grief. We heard from the head of Defense of Children International Palestine, who's based in the West Bank in Ramallah, who talked about the, the horrific conditions facing children now in Gaza, where there's severe cases of, of malnutrition of children with missing limbs, and you know, there being no anesthesia to, uh, to operate them, to, to help them with their surgeries, and, you know, and generations of family being destroyed. But then we had live witnesses, um, six or seven, I don't remember the exact number, of people who uh, are Gazans who now live in the United States talking about what's happening to their families. And, you know, some were talking how 50, 60, 70 members of their extended family have been destroyed. And, and one witness even said during one of the recesses um, of, of the hearing that day, he'd gotten news that yet another member of his family had been killed. And that was more, I think, than anything, the great accomplishment of Friday's hearing was that it was the perhaps the very first time in history that Palestinians had the, the full opportunity to, to speak freely, uninterrupted, no objections by the government or the judge to let them speak about their experiences and what's happening to their families in this moment. So we have eyewitness testimony to this genocide that was entered into a federal court on Friday. And regardless of the outcome of the case, that in and of itself is a huge victory to get that onto the record. The, the court did provide video uh, of the hearings that you can find online. Yes. We, we will link to it both on our KPFA website as well as our YouTube channel uh, for, for this video that we're also creating. Do, do, I just want to get back to the complexities of charging genocide today. We, we don't get sure. the, the first um, conviction of genocide until 1998, and, and this is in Rwanda, uh, concerning yeah. Rwanda. Um, is, is, and again, it, it gets sometimes these things get muddy, and it's, it's hard to know one way or the other, and I, I guess unless you're, you're there, I don't, I don't know if you have even an opinion on, on what's happening in China. Are, are the controversies, though, and complexities and difficulties that we're experiencing today, including in the question of Israel and, and Gaza, are these things that were being debated at the time in 1947 that would lead to the UN uh, Convention on Genocide? Yeah, so when, when the convention is finally ratified in 48, you know, it's the consequence of a long and contentious decision-making process. Um, and as complex as those arguments were, you know, they were thinking of the crimes that had recently occurred. Um, and of course, I don't think they could foresee the, the, the many, many forms and expressions of genocide that would occur after. Um, it, you know, it's, a, it's an incredibly important law, um, and yet it's not a particularly uh, effectual law because there's not really an enforcement mechanism to it. Individuals can be sued under, um, <laughs> crime, you know, for crimes in the International Criminal Court. Most of those cases are really unsuccessful. We know with, say, like the trials of... Um, uh, Milan, um, why can't I think of his name for the moment? Um, Yugoslavian, Serbian figure. Um, Milosevic? Milosevic, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Slobodan Milosevic. Um, you know, that, that trial just took years and years to happen, right? At the point at which the political situation had changed so dramatically that it has symbolic value, it has some moral value, I'm sure, for victims to see finally this person being brought to justice. But the, it, 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 doesn't, uh, it doesn't sort of have that preventative mechanism where 
it's strong enough to, clearly to stop nations from committing genocide for fear of prosecution. Can the UN Convention not be used for going back in time before 1948? Is this something that indigenous Americans can't use or even pogroms that have happened to Jews in Europe? Uh, no, I, don't, the I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I mean, the states still exist, right? So, you know, you know, the genocides committed by the United States, you know, of course, that happened. Um, there may be that descendants could press these cases. I don't know if that's been tried before. Um, the challenge, of course, is that um, the United States has certainly you know, exempted itself uh, from, from being charged uh, with this by other states. And so it becomes very, very challenging to find a mechanism in a court that's just willing to, to, to take up these cases. What, what were the, again, you're, you're a historian of the modern Jewish culture and, and people. What, what were the pogroms, say, in, in Russia and Eastern Europe, um, late 19th, early 20th century? Were, were, would that be considered genocide? Probably not, because most of those attacks were not state-sponsored. You know, those were um, sometimes um, acts that the, the state sort of benefited from, right? It was a way to deflect criticism off, say, you know, the, the, the Russian Empire, and you place it onto, onto Jews and hold them responsible for it. But by and large, most of those attacks were, were popular uprisings that were the, 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 you know, the, the flames of which were, were fanned by uh, anti-Semitic organizations, newspapers, sometimes political leaders, but usually the state itself had exempted itself from it. You know, and of course, the Russian Empire no longer exists, so there's nobody left to sue. Yeah. Uh, what, Barry Trachtenberg, as, as we move to wrap up here, what, what is the effect of genocide afterwards for a people? I mean, it's, uh, it's a permanent trauma to a people, you know, that lasts for generations and generations. And I'll, I'll say that, you know, so much of my own research on... The, the history of the Jewish experience in the Nazi Holocaust as part of that research. I, I've, I've listened and read, you know, hundreds of testimonies of survivors, of, of refugees, of Nazism. I work with their documents. That's what shapes so, so much of my own research. And, the, the, and they, they talk about the, the, the pain and the trauma and the, the guilt and the suffering that they carry with them sometimes, you know, half a century later um, when they're being interviewed it's as as if they're immediately in that moment and what i have to say resonated so powerfully for me about the hearing on friday uh, um, in, in which uh, you know two major palestinian organizations and a half a dozen plaintiffs or more took the federal government to court for its complicity um, and failure to prevent the genocide that's going right now that when they were telling their stories, they were using so much of the same language, so much of the same emotions that are present in these other Holocaust survivor testimonies. This sense of, of guilt about how every time they eat or drink, you know, they, they think about their family members who don't have access to uh, fresh food or, or clean water. When they sleep in a comfortable bed, they think about their, their families who are being bombed at, at home. Um, when they think about the safety that they're enjoying, they think about the, the, the precarity of their family members and how that is going to, to be with them for the rest of their lives. Um, and, and what's happening right now um, with this genocide, like genocides of, of the past, that it's not just people who are impacted by this, but it is the institutions the, uh, of culture and of society that are also destroyed. So right now what's happening in Gaza is that universities are being systematically leveled. The, the archives, uh, you know, the formal archives of the, the, the people of Gaza have been destroyed. Cemeteries are being bulldozed over right now. And so the, 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 the artifacts of that society, as well as the human beings who carry those memories in that history, all of that's being destroyed right now. I mean, the, I, I, 
I know you have a hard stop like, here. Yeah, the effects of that just will, it will last generations and generations. And you can see with how that trauma has shaped Jewish people in Jewish history, where, you know, traumas from the biblical era are ones that we still contend with as a people when we, when we have our holidays of Purim or of Passover and so many of, you know, Jewish holidays are ways to memorialize traumatic events. You know, we see that last thing, you know, and that, that's thousands of years now, and I have no doubt that this will be the experience of Palestinians. Some people react with surprise that for a people that experienced a genocide themselves could now potentially be participating in an unfolding genocide now. Um, I, I guess the way I see it is, should we be surprised that a traumatized people would be committing traumatizing acts on another people? Yeah, I, I, that's probably uh, a question for, you know, people who study uh, group psychology. Um, but I'll, I'll speak more plainly as a, a person who identifies as Jewish, who is uh, proud to be Jewish, who, you know, who's, who uh, has, you know, I've steeped myself in the study of, of Jewish people. Um, what I'll say is that one thing that I've learned from this, you know, um, studying this uh, history is that the experience of tra trauma does not sort of purify a people, right? It doesn't somehow render us a, a, a more moral people. It also, though, we have to, I think, be really clear to say that doesn't render us somehow more prone to commit genocide as well. You know, the, the Jewish people are a full people, which means we contain the, the best of humanity and the worst of humanity, and probably the, the rest of us, you know, fall in between. Um, and so I don't know if uh, we can identify as kind of national or, you know, sort of group psychological conditions of trauma and how that's uh, affecting this. Um, but, but I will say that, you know, we have to look very much so at the, the political conditions that led to the creation of the state of Israel, how it was predicated on the, the forced displacement of some three quarters of a million Palestinians, many of whom were shoved into the area that we now think of as the Gaza Strip. And they've been largely contained in that area and had their lives controlled in that space. And um, they're still you know, surviving, they're still protesting, they're, 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 they're still flourishing as a people. Um, and the response, the political choice of Israeli leaders and much of Israeli society has been to see that Palestinians are interlopers in their land and that ultimately this is Jewish space and anyone who's there who does not sort of fit that description, that narrow description of you know, uh, as a member of, of the Jewish nation, you know, shouldn't be there. I don't know if that's necessarily just a consequence of, of the Holocaust, but it's, it's certainly a factor. Barry Trachtenberg has been our guest. He has joined us for a conversation about genocide and its history. He holds the Reuben Presidential Chair in Jewish History at Wake Forest University in North Carolina. Barry Trachtenberg, I thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I really enjoyed our conversation. I appreciate you reaching out.